Now visual processing starts at the back of the head in occipital cortex but as the processing pathway then moves on um, visual areas you find visual areas either in parietal cortex at the top of the head or and in inferotemporal cortex so down here on the lower side of the brain and these are called the dorsal and ventral streams dorsal meaning the back side and ventral from the latin for stomach side and it turns out that you can and it seems that these two processing streams are associated with different aspects of vision in quite an interesting and unexpected way. So a famous patient who is associated with um, these kind of ideas that the ventral and dorsal stream do different things is known as DF from her initials. And she is a woman who suffered carbon monoxide poisoning in 1988 when she was aged 34. And obviously you can die from that, she nearly died, but she was found unconscious just in time. But the carbon monoxide poisoning had meant that not enough oxygen reached her brain for a critical period of time. And she suffered damage to different brain areas, but the areas that were most affected were those that were furthest from the major blood vessels. They were most oxygen deprived. And the area that was most severely affected in this way was an area known as lateral occipital cortex, so on the side of the occipital lobe. And as a result of that brain damage, DF suffered profound visual agnosia, which is the inability to recognise objects by vision. So patient DF would have a problem that um, if she were to be shown an object like this pen, she'd be able to see it, she'd be able to describe it to you. She might say something like, well, it's blue, it's kind of, I think it's long rather than all in a lump together. It's got some little white specks on it. She might be able to see details like the writing this pen has, but she wouldn't know that it was a pen until she reached out and touched it. And then she'd be able to tell from the feel of it that it was a pen, just like a blind person would, although she's not blind. And there's an intriguing demonstration of this, that she can move around her environment essentially unimpaired. So if you put the pen down on the desk somewhere in front of her and ask her to pick it up, she can instantly reach straight out and pick it up with the appropriate hand grip and so on. She doesn't have to grope for it like a blind person might. So she's not blind, but she can't recognise objects visually. And the suggestion put forward regarding patient DF is that her difficulties are because she's effectively functioning without a ventral stream, that this damage to lateral occipital cortex has essentially taken out much of her ventral processing. Here's a picture of the brain damage suffered by DF. So this is a structural MRI scan of her brain. Um, the little arrows uh, apparently highlight areas of atrophy. Um, and then you can see the particularly badly lesioned areas here where the uh, cortex really has almost been eaten away by the loss of oxygen. And there again, uh, showing the, the severest lesions in DF compared to a control subject. And what they've done to get this yellow in the control subject is they have shown the person images of intact objects versus scrambled objects. Like imagine taking a photograph and cutting it up into little pieces and moving them around. So all the same kind of features are there, the same colours, the same edges, the same corners, but they're not in a way that makes sense as an object. And then you ask which areas of the brain respond more to the objects than to the scrambled objects. And in controls, the answer is LOC, lateral occipital cortex shown in these various views. And that's exactly the areas that are lesioned in DF. Now this uh, is an image taken from the figure in a famous nature paper on DF. And what this is showing is a task that they asked DF to do. So they showed DF a slot like a letterbox. But whereas letterboxes were always horizontal, this slot was mounted in a board that could be rotated. So it might be horizontal or vertical or oblique. And they asked DF to hold a card and rotate the card until it matched the orientation of the slot. And at the top are results for controls here. And they've aligned it so that vertical means same orientation as the slot actually was. And you can see controls are able to match within, what's that, maybe five or ten degrees. They're doing really well. And at the bottom here is DF, and she is all over the place. She doesn't have a clue. And sometimes you can see the errors are 90 degrees. So that means if she's shown a vertical slot, she holds her card up 
in a horizontal orientation or vice versa because she's really at chance. She has no idea what the orientation of this slot is. But over on the right, there's a really intriguing result. What David Milner and Mel Goodale, who wrote this paper, now asked DF to do was please post your card through the slot. Imagine it's a letterbox and post that card through the slot. And what they're showing now is the orientation of the card as it approached the letterbox in DF's hand. And you can see the errors are far less. She's never making these huge errors. She's automatically with her hand orienting the card correctly, even though she has no conscious awareness of the orientation of that slot. And you can read more about patient DF in quite an accessible, uh, interesting book that Milner and Goodale wrote about their work, which they called Sight Unseen, um, capturing this idea that you've lost the conscious perception. So these experiments and others like them have led to the idea that there's this distinction between the ventral and dorsal stream. Originally, ventral was called the what pathway and dorsal where, at least that was a sort of mnemonic people gave it, what versus where. So the idea is that for ventral, you're seeing object, you're seeing what something is, and in the dorsal stream, that's telling you where is that object. If I were to reach out and pick it up, where would it be? Milner and Goodale suggested that that was maybe not quite right, more it's that the ventral stream is vision for perception, whereas the dorsal stream is vision for action. So I can see objects with my ventral stream and with my dorsal stream, but it's more about the nature of the information I get about those objects. So importantly, we think that information in the ventral stream is consciously accessible, whereas information in the dorsal stream is unconscious. And that's why DS has this impairment. She's not consciously aware of what she's looking at. She can't consciously see that this is a pen, but unconsciously she has all sorts of visual information about it. And that's why she can reach out and pick it up so skillfully. There are some other differences associated with these. So it's been suggested that the ventral stream gives information about the world in, in world-centered coordinates. So I have this sense of the space around me and the ventral stream is informing me where objects are located in that space. And that's a relatively long lasting coordinate frame because I'm going to be in this room for, you know, potentially many minutes. I want to be able to link together information um, that I gather, maybe as I move my eyes around the scene, I want to build that all up into one image of the world around me. Whereas the dorsal stream uh, maybe gets information in body-centred coordinates. So where is that in relation to my hand right now? And that information decays rapidly because I move my hand quite often, so it's no good keeping long-term information about that. But for an immediate action, I would need to know that right now. And as often in psychology, a nice distinction is made between these two pathways by the existence of a double dissociation. So it's possible to damage one and leave the other unimpaired and vice versa. So if you damage the ventral stream, that results in this visual agnosia that we've discussed. Whereas damage to the dorsal stream results in the opposite situation known as optic ataxia, where your conscious vision is quite good and you can report what you're seeing. Yes, that's a pen, that's a cup, I can see that fine but people have a really hard time using their vision to guide their movements. So that kind of fluent, unconscious action that we all do, you reach out and pick something up, you don't consciously think, right, it's about 30 centimetres away and it's about 10 centimetres wide, so I must form, I must open my hand this much and advance it so far. That just happens for you. And in optic attacks, it doesn't just happen. So people do have to kind of consciously think hard about how they are going to use their vision to guide their movements. So this is still very much up for debate and very controversial. People still argue about exactly what the ventral and the dorsal pathways do. And it's for certain that there are strong links between them. They're constantly talking to each other. They're not happening in isolation. And it's still very much being worked out what these two visual pathways do. But I just wanted to introduce you to these ideas, uh, which I think are really fascinating, and the sense that our vision isn't one entity, but consists of many modules, and it's possible to damage um, one aspect, like motion perception, or object recognition, while leaving others intact, and I think that's quite surprising and quite counterintuitive.